With the recent COVID-19 pandemic, it has become tougher to attend majalis at centers. This Muharram, millions of people will not get the chance to go to their local Husseiniyya or Imam Baga. Flying to Karbala has become really difficult. This would mean that we all solely rely on TV stations such as ours to participate and recount the tragedies that befell upon Imam Hussein alayhi salam and his 72 companions. Our duty during the holy months of Muharram and Safa is to bring to you 40 days of exclusive feeds depicting the story of Karbala through live lectures, eulogies and images from the holy land of Karbala and not forgetting our 24-7 live broadcast of the world's biggest gathering on earth, the Arba'in Walk, the holy footsteps of Bibi Zainab and Bibi Raqqaya and the family of the Prophet will be shown all over the world. This is made possible by the sincere hard work and dedication of our media teams in London and Karbala, who braved the early hours of the morning to film, edit, broadcast fresh content for you every single day. Many other departments work tirelessly day in and day out to keep the five channels running smoothly for our dear viewers, especially those in the financial department raising funds to allow the channel to keep on streaming the beauty of Karbala in the comfort of your own homes for free. And so we are turning to you for your support that you would normally provide to your local Hussainiyat to raise funds in the name of the Master of the Martyrs Imam Hussein alayhi salam and his 72 companions. Imam Hussein Media Group are looking to raise £72,000 per channel in order to help and finance the broadcasting of its five channels during Muharram and the Arba'in season. This is a combined effort between all five channels to raise a total of £360,000. Make sure the name of Imam Hussein alayhi salam shall continue to echo throughout the ages of time. Help spread the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Be a part of the movement and be a part of the legacy of Imam Hussein alayhi salam today. Imam Hussein Media Group is moving to a new location. As the shrines plan to expand, we at Imam Hussein Media Group have secured and built a new building to help continue our efforts for Abba Abdullah. The 13-story building will be harboring all five channels at Imam Hussein Media Group, as well as space for filming studios, editing suites, server rooms, and a Husseiniya for the locals. Imam Hussein Media Group is giving all you viewers a chance to help and be a part of this venture we are embarking on. We are allowing people to support this project by donating $700. $700 is what it cost Imam Hussein TV to build, plaster, and paint one square meter of the building. Your donations will forever grant you reward and help you in your akhirah. For every show and program that is made and broadcasted, you will earn a share in its thawab. So please help and donate whatever you can. Remember, you are helping pave the way for millions to Karbala and to Imam Hussein. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين 
والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله يا علي لا يحبك إلا مؤمن ولا يبغضك إلا منافق معاوية بن أبي سفيان was the very embodiment of nifaq the very embodiment of hypocrisy both in his world view as well as in his actions. You will not find a person who had as much animosity to the holy household of the Prophet, peace be upon them, as Muawiyah, and especially towards Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. In reality, even though we're discussing Karbala, even at Karbala, the soldiers of Umar bin Sa'ad, when Imam al Hussein alayhi salam asked them, what have I done wrong to you for you to want to kill me like this? They replied by saying, we seek vengeance for what your father did. And we do this out of hatred for your father. The reality is that Karbala may not only have been about Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, but rather was about the merits of the man who without a doubt is the great news who people differ over. There's no doubt that when Imam Ali alayhi salam is known as a Naba al azim over which there is ikhtilaf, you found that Muawiyah sought as much as he could to exterminate the memory and the legacy and the traditions of Imam Ali alayhi salam. That's why it's no doubt a miracle that we still have hadiths from Imam Ali alayhi salam until today, especially hadiths which praise Imam Ali alayhi salam. As in when you read a hadith, for example, saying Ali is from me and I am from Ali. Or you read a hadith that Ali is to me like Harun was to Musa. Or you read a hadith, for example, that tomorrow I will give the banner to a man. Allah and him love me and me and Allah love him. When you read all of these traditions, it's a miracle that they reached us. These fadail of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. A miracle that they reached us from two angles, one may answer. On the one hand, one may say that it's God's light that can never be extinguished. On the other, there are also clearly in our history, non-Shia who used to love Imam Ali alayhi salam. And non-Shia who realized that people like Muawiyah had nothing to do with the religion of Islam. Because there were those scholars who are not Shia who insisted that Imam Ali's merit should not be forgotten. As in, if you look, for example, within Islamic history, you'll find certain scholars who made sure that they made clear that Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan done his utmost to abuse Imam Ali alayhi salam week in, week out. And done his utmost to censor any praise of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And done his utmost to disgrace Imam Ali alayhi salam. If you read, for example, in the Sahih, known as Sahih al-Bukhari, in Sahih of Muslim bin Hajjaj al Nisapuri, in the Tariq of Ibn al-Athir, in the Tariq of Ibn Asakir, in the Ansab of Baladhari, in the Sharh of Nahj al-Balagha, in the works of others within famous scholars of the non-Shia, they all in one way or another narrate Muawiyah's hate and abuse of Imam Ali alayhi salam, these aren't Shia. When I call Muawiyah a Munafiq or I call him a hypocrite, it's because there's a criteria in my religion for who is a Mu'min, who is a Munafiq, who is a Kafir. For goodness sake, there are chapters named after these titles. There's a surah called Al-Mu'minun. It tells me what a Mu'min is. 
There's a surah called Al-Munafiqoon. It gives me the criteria of Munafiqoon. There's a surah called Al-Kafirun. It tells me about the Kafirun. When I see a man in his whole life only seeking to abuse Imam Ali alayhi salam, what position does this put him? Are we still meant to say Radi Allah and next to his name? Because when you listen to this lecture and you see that there is a man who in your literature, not mine, I'll put mine on the side. In your literature, it says that this man was a man who taught generations to abuse Ali. This man was a man who ordered governors to abuse Ali. This man was a man who ordered governors to execute those who loved Ali. Be they known as Shi'at Ali or maybe just people who had respect for Imam Ali alayhi salam. And that's why you find that there are ulama who are not Shia, Sunni ulama, because of their love of Imam Ali alayhi salam and because of their hate of Muawiyah were tortured. Sunni ulama, not Shia, because of their love of Imam Ali alayhi salam and the fact that they disliked Muawiyah or they saw Muawiyah's plan, they were tortured. Therefore, when we look at Muawiyah's hypocrisy, Muawiyah made sure that he instituted a generation. When he took over as Khalifa 20 years before Karbala, a generation that hated the mention of Ali, that hated the children of Ali. In some cases, a generation that had never met Imam Ali alayhi salam. Muawiyah taught us the power of media, that if you are able to control the media, when Zainab walks through Sham, you could pelt her with a stone and not bat an eyelid. When Imam Zain al Abidin walks through Sham, you could look at them and not have a clue who they are. What he did in Sham in 20 years is remarkable, satanically remarkable. But what he achieved in those 20 years was he built a whole generation that found it normal to not just hate Amir al Mu'mineen but to hate the children of Amir al-Mu'mineen. In that way, Karbala became inevitable. Let us tonight look at Muawiyah's nifaq, his hypocrisy and the building blocks that ensured that Karbala happened, that the massacre took place and that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi's children were held as captives. And I'd like to do this in the following stages. Number one, which hadith in non-Shi'i literature is the biggest proof that Muawiyah is a munafiq, a hypocrite. Number two, if the hadith says that loving Ali is faith and hatred of him is hypocrisy, weren't there personalities who loved Ali and ended up being not that religious or against him? And aren't there people in the world today who love Ali but aren't the most religious in the world? How does that hadith then work? Number three, which famous alim from the Sunni world used to love Imam Ali, wrote a book in honor of Imam Ali, and was tortured because of the fada'il of Imam Ali against Muawiyah. Number four, how did Muawiyah make sure that cursing became normal? In which books in the Sunni world is there clear proof that Muawiyah, Marwan ibn al-Hakam, Mughira ibn Shu'ba, and others found it normal in the Jum'ah khutbah amongst other places, to curse Imam Ali alayhi salam. Further than that, in Sahih Muslim, how clear is the hadith about cursing Imam Ali and how normal had that cursing been done? Further than that, how did Muawiyah make sure that if there was a verse revealed about Imam Ali, he changes the tafsir? Further than that, how did he stress that don't let the kids be named Ali? And how important is it for us that we ensure that our children's name is Ali? even if there's a number of Ali's. And finally, to conclude, who on the 10th of Muharram was Muawiyah's great nephew and related to Yazid. But when he stood in front of them, he said, I am a ghulam who's only Hashimi and Alawi and nothing else. Let's examine this and dissect this topic in complete depth. Someone might turn around to me and say that when you say Muawiyah is a munafiq, this is a strong statement to make. There are those who come from different angles. One angle will be those who say typical of the Shia, that they curse the Sahaba. Well, I've showed you in the last few nights someone who called the Prophet delirious. That wasn't enough for you. As in if someone called your Prophet delirious and you have respect for him, me cursing the companion, 
known as Muawiyah is nothing that sh should make you lose any sleep. Anyway, someone can come from that angle where that person says that you are cursing Muawiyah by calling him a hypocrite. In Sunni literature, you can see works like Sunan Tirmidhi or the Fadail of the Sahaba by Ahmed bin Hanbal. There is a narration and this narration is as clear as day. The narration states that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, of course, the context is given different in the books of Hadith. Some mention it as alongside the Battle of Tabuk, when the Prophet heads towards Tabuk and he leaves Imam Ali behind where? In Medina. When he leaves Imam Ali behind in Medina, the rumor goes round that Ali ibn Abi Talib is a burden for the Prophet. And that's why the Prophet does not take the Imam with him. When the Prophet discusses this with the Imam, he makes it clear to him that, Oh Ali, is it not enough that you are to me like Harun was to Musa? Except that there is no Prophet after me. Tell me which of the companions ever got compared to a, compa to a Prophet of Allah. There are many around the Prophet and there's thousands of Prophets of God. You know, you could even make up the name of a Prophet if you want to make a comparison. I've been to places around the Muslim world where they tell me this Prophet's buried here. I don't know who that Prophet is. I've never heard of him. But someone tells me that this man here is a prophet. We read the Fatihah and we move on. You could say, for example, companion X can be compared to Nabi Yunus or companion Y can be compared to Nabi Saleh. But which companion was compared to the prophet except Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam? Where the prophet said, Ali, you are to me like Harun was to Musa. That your level, O oh Ali, is the level of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Except that there's no prophet after me is that lowering imam ali not at all he's so high that allah made sure he was reserved to be the protector of the final message of allah how high must you be that you're the one of all the messages of allah allah decides that you're the one who has to stay till the end to protect that message then the prophet says a line ya ali know this line la yuhibbuka illa Munafiq. Oh Ali, none loves you except that he is a believer. And none hates you except that he is a hypocrite. Ya Rasulullah, why would you mention this line before you die? Why are you mentioning this line? Tabuk is a couple of years before the Prophet dies. Why stress on this? Because the Prophet knows that after I die, I'm giving you guidance who to hold on to. You may be confused at Jamal, you certainly were baffled. And at Safin, you were confused as well. So I leave behind traditions for you. So there's no confusion. None loves you, O oh Ali, except he is a mu'min. And none hates you except the munafiq. That means. That is a criteria for haqq and batil for me. The one who loves Imam Ali alayhi salam, the Prophet says, is a believer. And the one who hates Imam Ali alayhi salam, what are they? Muslim? Sinful? What are they? La yubghidhuka illa munafiq. That none hates you except that they are a munafiq. That means that anybody who hated, and how is hate displayed in life? What are the different ways in which hate is displayed? One way is when you blatantly don't mention someone's fadila or his merit in a narration where you keep saying, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot. It's unbelievable that there are some people when they mention their dad, they don't forget anything. But when it's Ali's merit, they forget Ali. When it's dad, dad's name is always mentioned. But when Amir al muminins name, I forgot who the other person was. That's hate. Hate is to raise your sword against Imam Ali. Hate is to threaten the, uh, and to burn the house of Imam Ali salam. In Sunni literature, as clear as day, that there was a group who threatened to burn the house of Fatima because they felt that people were conspiring against the government. Hate is to raise an army against Imam Ali. You don't raise an army with 20,000 swordsmen if you like someone, do you? As logically speaking, as in if you saw 20,000 people come towards this studio, and they came with their swords. They not really coming with love, are they? As like if you come with the machetes, you're not coming to say, well, you know, I love you, but this machete is only here to decapitate you if I get the chance. That's not love. That's hate. 
Therefore, when I want to put everybody into that criteria, and that's why when people come and ask us Shia, why is it certain people you don't revere? It's because I'm using my aql. I did not see Allah, unfortunately. My eyes cannot perceive. So I only understood my Lord intellectually. When I, therefore, look at my religion as well, I look at my religion through the aql, not through looking at just simply what my fathers say. I see the Prophet saying, O oh, Ali, la yuhibbuka illa mu'min. There are many non-Shia in the world today. Can they be called munafiqoon? No, because many of them love Ali ibn Abi Talib. Many of them who are not Shia love Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Their love is that they will never reach a stage where they will have hate of Ali. But the litmus test is, do they love those who fought Ali? This is a litmus test. You cannot have two hearts in one body. I cannot say, Radi Allah an fought Radi Allah an. That logically is not making any sense. That the killer and the killed are fighting each other. Therefore, when I come and look at who are the munafiqs, on top of them, Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan. Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan fights Imam Ali alayhi salam at Safin. Blatantly, there's no peace talks. In Jamal, they said that Aisha came to Jamal for peace talks and that there was a fitna, she tried to resolve it. At Safin, there was no such thing as peace talks. Safin, in the backlog of it, he already wanted to come with a vengeance against Imam Ali السلام, and those who support Imam Ali. Therefore, for me as a Shi'i, when I'm reading a hadith, not in my books, in non-Shi'a books, and it says to me that, Oh Ali, none loves you except that they are a believer and none hates you except that they're a munafiq. Then after that, I look at it, I'm like, well, now I understand who I have wilaya of and who I have tabarra from. Isn't that true? As in I know now, those who loved Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, Shi'at Ali, those I admire because they are the ones who held on to him. And those who fought him become in my eyes the worst of the people. And I dissociate from their actions. That's why in our ziyarat when people say, why do you say Allahumma al-an, for example, Abba Sufyan, Allahumma al-an Muawiyah, Allahumma al-an Yazid, Pretty simple because I see that these people hated who? Hated Imam Ali alayhi salam. And the Prophet said, none hates you except they're a munafiq. So I want Allah to withdraw his rahmah from all of these munafiqun. I want nothing to do with them. Question someone asked. If a person, none loves him except he's a believer. And none hates him except that he's a hypocrite. How comes there were some who, for example, used to love him, let's say, or were on his side and left him. And there were some who may have hated him, who joined him. How then does the hadith explain itself? Because there was one scholar of the non-Shia who said, you know, these types of hadiths for Ali, their isnad is 100% sahih. 100%. But if you look at the wording, it's contradictory. So why is it contradictory or hater of Ali? Tell me, why is it? Because what do you think? The, the haters of Amir al-Mu'mineen ended? Not ended. There are still many of Muawiyah's love children. All of them are still around. They're all still around in the world. One of them, he said, look, listen, it's not that, O oh, Ali, la yuhibbuka illa mu'min wa la yubghidhuka illa munafiq. It's not a sahih. You cannot deny. But the words are contradictory. Why? There are those who loved Ali who ended up fighting him. So therefore, this is a fake hadith. You can love Ali ibn Abi Talib, but your aqib at the end could be the worst. Your ending could be bad. We're not saying just saying, I love Amir al-Mu'mineen is enough for a person to be a mu'min. What's the point of me saying, I love Amir al-Mu'mineen, I don't pray? How many do you know? Friends of us, they love Ali ibn Abi Talib. They could be on a night out with their friends. They will not pray at all. They won't pray. But he loves Ali ibn Abi Talib. This person loving Ali, is he counted straight away as a mu'min? No, no. You love Ali and follow the principles of Ali. Amir al-Mu'mineen dies in his salah and you end up not praying? Now where's the respect for the Amir? Where's the respect? He has his head cut open in salah and you have the audacity to say that you love him and you don't pray? Therefore, when a person came and said, well, there are those who were in his army and they turn against him. So this hadith is fake. Ziyad, Ubaidullah's father, was in Imam Ali's army. Ubaidullah bin Ziyad, his dad Ziyad, was in Imam Ali's army. He ended up turning against Imam Ali. The person said, look, 
Loving Ali is meant to be a sign of a mu'min. How, how about those who turned? Oh, he turned. That's his aqaba being rubbish at the end. That's his ending being rubbish. That's it. Why are you causing confusion? Loving Ali ibn Abi Talib is a means for a person to grow. Because through loving Amir al muminin you get closer to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Ultimately, why do I love Amir al muminin Because he is the gate to the city of knowledge. And that's why you find that there were people. Wallah, how much they loved Imam Ali alayhi salam. It caused them to lose prestige because they put Ali above Muawiyah. I'll give you a prime example. A huge example, in fact. When you ask our brothers, name the six Sahih books. Which ones do they normally name? They name Bukhari, Muslim. They'll name, for example, Tirmidhi. They'll mention, for example, Abu Dawood. They'll mention Ibn Majah. What's the last one that they'll mention? Nasai. Nasai. Nasai is a huge scholar. And in some pieces of literature, a Nasai would be more stringent on hadith criteria than Bukhari and Muslim. But why is his book not as famous as Bukhari and Muslim? Why is it in the world today you always say Sahih al Bukhari, Sahih Muslim? Normally we hear the six Sahih. But you only hear Bukhari and Muslim as the main ones. Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, Tirmidhi, Amish. Nasai in his knowledge of the world of Hadith is as high as Bukhari and Muslim. But why his book, Sunan and Nasai, doesn't get the same accolades as Bukhari and Muslim? Because fihi a little of the tashayyu'. There's a little of tashayyu' in him. You think he had some tashayyu'? It's not tashayyu'. It's he loved Amir al muminin he loved Imam Ali alayhi salam. He loved Imam Ali. He was in Egypt. He left Egypt, came to Syria. Came to Syria, everyone's like, oh, the famous muhaddith has come. And Nasai, everyone's welcoming him. When everybody came and they asked him that you are the one who knows the hadiths of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, narrate to us the merits of Muawiyah. Ahl sham they want Muawiyah. I have nothing to narrate about him. Sorry? So Baba, you've got a book, Khasa'is Ali ibn Abi Talib. He's got a book all on the merits of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And do you know Ali ibn Abi Talib, if you read some works of non shia I know what they say, no man has as many merits in hadith as Ali ibn Abi Talib. It's phenomenal. I don't know. Only Allah's light cannot be extinguished. How much they try to delete these merits. You'll find some scholars like Ibn Hajar al-Haytham is saying, no one has as many merits as Ali. They said, Nasai, Baba, give us something on Muawiyah. He said, there's nothing. There's nothing. What did I say a couple days ago? I said, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani in Fath al-Bari says, Abdullah, son of Ahmed bin Hanbal, asked his dad about Muawiyah's hadiths. He said, Baba, none of them, there's nothing, no praise of him. Because they hated Ali, they made merits for him. He said to him, there's nothing. He said, nothing? He said, maybe if there's one, maybe Allahumma la tushbi' batnahu, for example. It's a, it's a sick line, that one, I must admit. Yeah, that's a sick line. That stomach, never let it be full. What a, subhan, what a huge, that is a huge merit. And by the way, we may laugh. They're now using it. Now it's being used as a proof of a good merit. If in this world your stomach is never full, Allah will fill it on the day of judgment. <laughs> oh Allah, do not let his stomach be full. Truly, the man, when he died, was a little bit overweight. Nasai looked at them, he said, that's all I have. You know what they did? Start to attack him, start to hit him. They started to attack the man. The man died of torture wounds. Why? Simply, and if you go and read the Habi and others, what they say, say in Nasai, there's a little bit of tashayyu in him, as if it's a negative. Baba Nasai is saying, hold on, are you now, have we really reached the stage, Muawiyah and Ali are equal? Wallah haram. Yani Ali ibn Abi Talib, what he gave at Badr and Uhud and Khandaq and Khaybar and all his merits, the man who slept on the bed of Rasulullah that night on Hijra, the man married to the daughter of the Prophet, the man on Mubahala, the man... And now, his son and him are equal? And Nasai, the only reason his book is not Bukhari and Muslim is because of his leaning to Ali. Bukhari, how many merits of Ali ibn Abi Talib he has? Six. Three of them 
Our merits, the other three, he indirectly attacks. And Nasa'i said, forget merits in Sunan. Forget that. I'll write a whole book about his merits. A whole book. That's why in life, there may be people who are not Shia. But just because they're not Shia doesn't mean they don't love Amir al-Mu'mineen. There are many who are not Shia. They love Ali ibn Abi Talib with a passion. They understand when they read history, they understand that a disservice has been done. And you know what's the biggest disservice? That Ali ibn Abi Talib could be cursed every week in the Jum'ah Khutbah. It's the biggest insult in the history of this religion is Amir al-Mu'mineen. Week in, week out, on the Friday Khutbah is being cursed by who? Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Yeah, Marwan ibn al-Hakam, this person who was banished by the Prophet, becomes governor of which city? Which city do you think he became governor of? He's banished by the very man who's buried in that city. Medina. They tell me, Karbala, how did it happen? I say, if Marwan's become governor of Medina, you think Karbala's far-fetched? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, who had banished Marwan, Marwan became governor where? Of Medina. Ahmed bin Hanbal has a text. Many don't refer to it. People refer to his Musnad or some people mention the Fada'il al-Sahaba. There's a text called Al-Ilal. It's a Rijali work. Within there, Ahmed bin Hanbal discusses Marwan ibn al-Hakam, governor of Medina, for six years in a row, every Friday. How many Fridays would that be, mathematicians? Six years in a row? That would be close to what, 300? Fr well, I don't know. 300 Fridays? How many Fridays is that? Six years. Something like this, let's just say. How many Fridays? 300 and? May Allah bless your mathematics. 312 Fridays in a row. Now on a Friday, Jum'ah Khutbah, what do we want to hear? Well, Salah. We want to hear about, for example, Akhlaq. We want to hear maybe a bit about how we can spiritually improve ourselves. That's why we come to Salat al-Jum'ah. Marwan ibn al-Hakam, six years in a row in Medina, near the grave of the man who bought the religion every week, cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ahmed bin Hanbal, one may ask, why is he narrating this? Isn't he putting down someone like Marwan? Ahmed bin Hanbal wrote a whole book about the fada'il of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Ahmed bin Hanbal wanted to make clear that, listen, this has become a joke now. You comparing Muawiyah and Ali, you're putting Yazid and Hussein and all of these together. This is nonsense now. Ahmed bin Hanbal narrates that Marwan ibn al-Hakam for six years in a row, and they tell us, you Shia, you all curse the Sahaba. Baba, who begun this cursing? Who begun it? Who begun this method that was there of the cursing? The method was begun by the Umayyads when they assumed the pulpit. Six years, he ended his six-year term. Two years, Sa'id ibn al-As took over from him. No more cursing. Couple years later, Sa'id was removed. They put Marwan bin Hakim again. The cursing continued. You begin a khutbah, and in that khutbah, you begin by cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is simple. You know what the problem is with Salat al-Jum'ah? What's the issue? There may be a 50-year-old sitting in the Friday prayer. There's also a 14-year-old maybe sitting there. You are gassing up that 14-year-old to hate this man. One day with a stone, that 14-year-old will pelt this man's granddaughter. Mosques are about who's reciting. If I have someone reciting a Jum'ah khutbah and he's building a community, then the future of the ethics of that community will be there. But mosques are also about if someone destroys. Marwan ibn al-Hakam ibn Asakir narrates, Marwan says we used Ali ibn Abi Talib as a scapegoat for all the trouble that happened. Subhanallah, how satanic can you be? We used Imam Ali as a scapegoat, meaning Uthman being killed, trouble between the Muslims. We used Ali ibn Abi Talib, we have already a hatred for him, we used him as the scapegoat. Blatantly, this is not Shia literature. Ibn Asakir says that Marwan said we used Ali ibn Abi Talib as what? As a scapegoat. Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Mu'aw ibn Abi Subyan. The moment he comes into power, the moment he comes in, what's the first thing he does? Ibn Abi al-Hadid, Sharh ibn Nahj al-Balagha. He says the moment he can say, may Allah curse Abu Turab. Straight away. True. You're telling me, why do I call Mu'awiyah mana munafiq? Mu'inta, you tell me you love the four rightly guided khulafa. So if you do and someone curses, Wallah, if he had cursed 
the second Khalifa, that person, they would have killed his reputation. If it was the second Khalifa, they would have killed his reputation. But Ali ibn Abi Talib, no. Ali ibn Abi Talib, if you curse him, you're both still Muslims. You're both still Muslims. Ibn Taymiyyah even says that, you know, the cursing of Ali and these things, this is ijtihad. And people get these things wrong. Anna, who's never met Imam Ali, all I've done is read about him. I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides me. I won't even come near cursing a person who's a neighbor of ours who might have done something wrong to me. Let alone a person with all those merits. Muawiyah comes into power. First sermon, what does he do? Straight away, may God curse Abu Turab. Young girls and boys are growing up in Sham. The fire is being lit that, you know, one day if I become a soldier, I can't wait. I'll take all his kids out. Because what are you doing to them? You're telling them that this is the worst human on earth. You know when Imam Ali died? You all know the story. In Sham, they heard Ali died. said, how did he die? He said, in Salah. He said, does he pray? He prays. They were baffled. Why were they baffled? 20 years of education, night courses, day courses, curse Ali, curse Ali. Such a blatant hadith as the hadith in Sahih Muslim. Allahu Akbar. Google it all of you tonight. Narrated by Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas' son. Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, father of Umar bin Sa'ad, commander of the armed forces at Karbala. He had Umar and he had Amr. Amr, son of Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, says that Muawiyah asked my father, what prevents you from cursing Abu Turab? Blatant. Do you know how hard the effort they put in to change this hadith? How? Not the wording. If I say to you, what's stopping you from cursing Abu Turab? How is it normally understood? Why are you not cursing Abu Turab? What do they make it sound like Muawiyah saying? Why when everyone's cursing Abu Turab, what has prevented you from cursing? What's the magic trick that you have that I could follow? Why are you not cursing? I want to be like you. Baba, yeah, I want to be like you. I just fought him a couple of years earlier in the battle. You don't just suddenly become best friends. He asks Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, he says to him, this is in Bukhari, but many of the listeners out there, wallah, many of them, they're not told these hadiths. These they're not told. No, the Shia Kuffar, Shia Munafiq, Shia this. Bab, look in your book. Muawiyah Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas. He asks him, what prevents you from cursing Abu Turab? Ma mana'aka anta subba Abu Turab. What stops you from cursing Abu Turab? Sa'ad goes, I won't curse Abu Turab. Sa'ad had a stand where he said, I will not curse Abu Turab. Imagine how many were because that was the number one state policy. Curse Abu Turab. If you can finish Ali, you finish pure Islam. Never forget this line. If you finish Imam Ali salam's name, you finish pure Islam. Because all you're left is with Amr ibn al-As's followers, Mughira ibn Shu'bas. What are you left with? Arab religion. You're not left with spirituality. You're not left with mysticism. You're not left with ethics. You're just left with... Ali ibn Abi Talib, fourth Khalifa, left me this many du'as. If you bring all the other Khulafa of Islamic history all together, they don't have half of the du'as he left. Muawiyah knew, finish Ali's name, you finish Muhammad's religion. The rest of the religion is dead. There's nothing else. There's no spirituality. It just becomes Arabs in power. What prevents you? Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas turns around to him and says, I will never curse Ali. So why? He said three things. These three, I want all of you, wherever you're listening, here, there, everywhere in the world, these three, bring up your children, make sure they know each of these. Instill it in your children, the way our parents instilled his love in us. Instill it in your children. Clear, tawalla and tabarra, both. Loving Ali and despising his enemies. Despising hate. Someone says, Sayyidina, you know, hate. Why hate? I say, if I love truth, I hate falsehood. And if I love justice, I hate injustice. So if I love Ali ibn Abi Talib, what? I also love those who fought him? He said, three reasons. So what's the three reasons? He said, number one, Tabuk. When the Prophet said to him, you are to me like Aaron is to Musa. Number two, Khaybar. 
When everyone tried, everyone failed. Same story, every battle. Until Imam Ali السلام, went there and the Prophet said, I'm going to give the banner to a man. Allah and me love him. And he loves me and Allah. Karrar, ghayr farrar. Third one. What's the third? Tabuk. Khaybar. What's the third? The only man who the Quran called the nafs of Muhammad. On the day of Mubahala with the Christians. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Surah 3, verse number 59. فَمَنْ حَاجَّكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنْ الْعِلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَدْعُوا أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ ثُمَّ نَبْتَهِلْ فَنَجْعَلْ لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ The Quran said, bring your sons, we'll bring ours. Who was there that day? Hassan. How old? Six. Hussein, five. Nisa'ana wa nisa'akum. Bring your woman, we'll bring us. Who did he bring as his woman? Fatima. Bring yourselves, the Christians are told. We'll bring ourselves. Who does he take as his nafs? Nafs. Not companion. Didn't say, Nisa'ana wa nisa'akum. Abna'ana wa abna'akum. Ashabuna wa ashabuna. Did it say, Nisa'ana? Said Anfusana, his soul and Muhammad's are one. That is the highest level you can reach in Islam. That you and Muhammad's Noor are equal. How many hadiths you see? My Noor and Ali's was created years before Adam. The two highest figures in the religion of Islam. Make no doubt about that. The two highest figures in the religion of Islam. Sa'ad said, I'm not going to curse Muawiyah. Well, I can't say much to Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas. Big name. He said, these are the three reasons I'll never curse. The same, you go to Sahih al-Bukhari. It's reached the stage in Medina, they come to Sahel bin Sa'ad. How many of you here have heard of Sahel bin Sa'ad? Where do we normally mention Sahel bin Sa'ad al Sa'adi? Who can remember? Sahel bin Sa'ad al Sa'adi in Sham. When he sees the chain on Zayn al Abidin's neck and he tells him, I'm your grandfather's companion. Sahel is asked, Why don't you curse Abu Turab? Blatantly, blatant. In Medina, they had reached a level, they were raising their children to curse. That's why, you know, Sahel bin Sa'ad says in Sham, I was walking through, I'm looking around, I'm thinking, What's going on here? What's happening? He said, I looked around, I saw people were partying, merrymaking. It's a yom, it's a day where Bani Umayyah were having a party. He said to them, to the people of Sham, he said, is it a day of Eid? They're like, no, no. So he said, so what's going on? Why is everyone celebrating? The person said to him, don't be surprised. If the skies cave in and the earth swallows its inhabitants. So what do you mean? Are you an Arab nomad? He said to Sahel. He said, no, I'm Sahel bin Sa'ad al-Sa'adi, companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. He said, look at them. Do you see all of them? He said, yes. He said, do you know who that is? He said, who? He said, that's Zainab bin Ali. And who's that? That's Ali ibn al Hussein, Zain al Abidin. Suddenly, Sahel's thinking, look at the media campaign where it reached that Rasulullah's grandchildren are being paraded in the streets of Sham. Sahel comes to Imam Zayn al-Abdin and says, Oh, Ali ibn al-Hussein, I'm your grandfather's friend. And Imam says, go and buy a piece of cloth, please. Sahel says, I went, bought a piece of cloth. I bought, I wanted, what did Zayn Abdi want to do? He said, he placed the cloth between the chain and his neck. Allahu Akbar. Between the chain and his neck. He said, Sahel, since Karbala, this chain has cut into this neck. Allahu Akbar. Imagine. Since Karbala, this chain has cut into this neck of mine. Sahel, help the daughters of Al Muhammad. Imagine, that was the power of that cursing. Muawiyah. Curses. This person, Marwan, curses. Mughira bin Shu'ba. I remember reading the Muslim of Ahmed bin Hamil. Go read it. Mughira bin Shu'ba in Kufa, cursing Imam Ali. And you know, you hear, I've seen lecturers in certain mosques. Mughira bin Shu'ba, radiallahu anha. 
مو أنا as a Shi'i when I do لعنة يا حبيبي والله when I do لعنة I don't do it because I have not researched or analyzed literature I do it because I see a man cursing your Khalifa and my Imam until Zayd bin Arqam stood up against Mughira bin Shu'ba he said did not Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam don't curse the deceased at the very least if you don't like Ali ibn Abi Talib he's gone back to his Lord have that level of respect for him. Mughira bin Shu'bah, Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Who else? Ziyad bin Abi. He is another one cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib. Institution. Curse, got up. Jum'ah, curse Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam Who stood up against them? Allah. Those who stood up, we owe them. Wallah, each of us owes them. Why do us Shia love going ziyara to different shrines around the world? Why do we do that? People could call me grave worshipper from now till the day I die. Wallah, I'm not going to lose any sleep about what you call me. You can call me grave worshipper. I'm still around. I'm 20% of the Muslim world and we still dominate anyway. But no problem. Here, you're calling me grave worshipper. No problem. I don't mind. There are many non-Shia, by the way, who love going to Jannah al baqi They love going to visit. I've seen in Egypt people visit Sayyidina al-Hussein, they say, and Sayyidina Zainab. I've seen in Pakistan, Abdullah Shah Qazi, people go and visit his shrine. There are many Muslims in the world who are not like those who all they have is... A... So, you have with these people, they say that we are grave worship. No, 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 no. We honor those who stood for Wilayat Ali, alayhi salam. Those who laid down their lives, laid down their necks. Those who allowed us to say every day, Alhamdulillah, الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية أمير المؤمنين. The likes of who? Hajar bin Adi al-Kindi, number one. You cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib? He just got up. He said, no chance. He said, but it's Jum'ah khutbah. He said, I don't care. I'm going to interrupt the khutbah. But you know, you're going to interrupt the khutbah. They're going to execute you. They took 14 of them. Exactly like what ISIS did. You stop people on the Hawiyah, on the ID. They stop them. Said to Hajar bin Adi, seven, 14 of them. Said seven of them. He said to all 14, curse Ali ibn Abi Talib in front of us now. Seven of them cursed. Which is not haram, by the way, because it's a moment of taqiyya. The other seven never cursed. No cursing. And he said to Muawiyah's foot soldiers, he said to them, you know what, don't take my cuffs off me as well. I want to meet my prophet with these on. This same Hujr, a few years earlier, was the one who opened that area, Marj Adra, 20 minutes from Sayyidah Zainab's shrine in Sham. Now the same Hujr is about to be executed. What's your final wish? You all know the story. Last wish before you die. He's there. His son's there. Five others are there. They're all buried there until ISIS blew up the building a few years ago. Let them blow up. They don't realize our Shia has an honor for us to die like this. They blow us up. It's a big honor. You don't want to die some death, you know, caught in a hole, a rat hole somewhere. He said to him, what's your final wish before you die? He said, oh, it's easy. Kill my son. He said, kill my son. Kill him. His final wish. It's not like the son said, Dad, why are you saying this? Hey, neck out. The son died. So he looked at Hajar and said, why? He said, I had to die knowing that I brought up a boy loving Ali. If I got killed, he might have left my path and gone to Muawiyah's. Now I'm ready to die. My boy died loving Ali ibn Abi Talib. Look at that wilaya. He stood up against Muawiyah. He lost his life. And you want to know the man what he is? The fact that ISIS bombs his place gives you an understanding. Hujr bin Adi, we will never stop visiting. Who else? Amr bin Hamak, al Khuzai. Loyal to Ali ibn Abi Talib. How dare you curse my Mullah? No chance. Stood up. Ziyad, Mughira, the rest of you filth. Think we're going to sit down? As Shi'at Ali? No chance. It's not going to happen. Muawiyah made sure he was beheaded. The first head to be buried in Islamic history. On the spear, middle of the streets. Any of you dare, we'll do what we've done to Amr bin Hamak. And they threw his head to his wife, Amina. She just looked at him. Curse be on you. You think you worry me by throwing my husband's head at me. Imagine Amr bin Hamak al-Khuzai. 
Because Muawiyah and his cursing was blatant. Mind you, did Imam Ali curse Muawiyah? Yes. And Baladuri in his Ansab mentions that Imam Ali السلام, in his Qunut used to curse Muawiyah and Amr ibn al As and Walid bin Uqba and al Dahak bin Qais. La yuhibbuka illa mu'min wa la yubghidhuka illa munafiq. If Ali ibn Abi Talib does a Qunut against you, you're munafiq. Simple as. Did Muawiyah in turn curse Imam Ali? Yes. In Muawiyah's Qunut, who would he curse? Listen to the wonderful logic of the religion. First person he'd curse, Imam Ali. Second, Imam al Hassan. Third, Imam al Hussein. Fourth, Abdullah ibn Abbas. His son, you explain to me one thing. I beg you. If a person curses these four, you still say, Radiyallahu an. So forget Imam Ali, Imam Hassan, Hussein. Let's say they're not important. They're not him. They're just the family of Rasulullah. Nothing to really lose sleep over. So Ibn Abbas, more every day Ibn Abbas narrated Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas. Ibn, more Ibn Abbas is being cursed by Muawiyah. No, Ibn Taymiyyah says, it's jihad gone wrong. It's jihad. It's jihad. And you know, sometimes our jihad goes skewed. Everything's a jihad. Baba, what is this? Yani, the whole of the house that graduated everyone in fiqh. Everyone got graduated in religion. And everyone's opinions are opposite completely and it's all alright. He would curse. But Imam also made it clear for us. There's no harm in cursing. Those who fought Al-Muhammad. You can have a general curse if not by name. Whoever are the enemies of Al-Muhammad. We ask Allah to withdraw his rahmah from them. So therefore who else stood up? Hujr stood up. Amr bin Hamak. Muhammad bin Abu Bakr. Not Khal al muminin No, 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 no. Only Muawiyah is Khal. Aisha's brother is not Khal. Why? Because he's loyal to Ali. How do you kill Aisha's brother? What's the way you kill a human being? You might shoot the guy. I don't know if guns were around at that time in Egypt to shoot him. Maybe not shoot him. Then how else could you kill someone? Maybe poison him. Okay. Killed him. And then after that, they put his body in a donkey and they burnt the donkey. Why? Simple loyalty to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Who else? Malik al-Ashtar. Muawiyah ordered for him to be killed. Who else? At the end, Muawiyah left such a legacy of killing those who praise Abu Turab. It continued with his henchman Ziyad and Ziyad's son. Who killed Maytham at Tamar? May Allah bless Maytham's soul. Allah. 20 days before Ashura. Maytham at Tamar. Imam had told him and he had told Habib ibn Madahir and he had told Rashid al-Hajari, all of you one day will reach a stage where you will be killed because of your love for me, love for Al Muhammad. You ready? Maytham said, I'm ready. He said, Maytham, are you ready? You'll be crucified on a palm tree. Tamar, Tamar, palm tree. He said, honor. When they put him on that palm tree, Ibn Ziyad, la'natullah alayhi, put Maytham and Tamar on that palm tree, Maytham said, you know what? Do what you want to do. My master said I'm going to be crucified here. Ibn Ziyad said, how did he say I'll be crucified? He said, I'll be crucified praising him day and night. I won't stop talking. I'll say all his merits nonstop. Look at these. The ones who made sure that we knew Ali is these. Ibn Ziyad said, then I'll prove your master wrong. I won't kill you. Praise him as much as you want. Maytham continued to praise and praise and praise. Never forget Maytham's tongue. Never forget Hujr's neck. Never forget Malik stand. Never forget these personalities. These are the ones who had the wilaya. Some were different levels to others, but they had wilaya. They held on to the pristine Islam because he kept on praising Imam Ali, kept on praising, kept on praising, kept on praising. Ibn Ziyad ended up cutting his tongue and stabbing him. Simple. Simple love for Ali ibn Abi Talib is the reason we get killed. That's the reason you kill me because I love Amir al muminin alayhi salam. That's the reason you crucify. Do you know thousands were crucified because of their love of Amir al muminin And because they stood up against Muawiyah and his henchmen. How else did Muawiyah make sure that the Syrians and others hated Ali? Number one, if a verse of the Quran was revealed in honor of Imam Ali, change the tafsir. Give it to someone else. Samara bin Jundub, who the Prophet had banished, was now writer of Quran tafsir. Imagine what he's going to do to Ali ibn Abi Talib's name. 
And people say to me, why is Imam Ali's name not in the Quran? Habibi, when his name's in the tafsir, they deleted it. You think they weren't going to delete his name if it was in the Quran? Secondly, what, do you, what else do you do? You make sure that kids who are named Ali, you reprimand or you don't let anyone. Do you know in Hadith literature, I used to come across Ulay. Say, what's Ulay? I don't understand. Ulay? And it turned out that people who were called Ali, they would put a spin on the name so that their families would not be in trouble. He finds out someone's called Ali. And that's why you notice with Al Muhammad, they never stop naming Ali. How many of our Imams are Ali? Imam Amir al Mu'mineen, alayhi salam. Imam Zayn al Abideen, Ali ibn al Hussein. Imam Ali al Rida. Imam Ali al Hadi. Allahu Akbar. The most names of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt is Ali. You agree? Today I hear, of course, these names which baffle me. I don't even know what they mean. Wallah. Yeah, I, you people who are Shi'at Ali, I know you live in the West. Whoever of you is listening, you live in the West. And I know people want to fit in. Right? It's okay. You can fit in in many ways, but to not be proud of Al Muhammad's names, the way our parents named us with their names. And we end up naming, Wallah, I hear names these days. The worst thing is when they call me and to tell me like, do you think this name is all right? Well, but there's enough options. Why are you calling me about some obscure name? Google, nice names. And you look at Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. If I had a thousand daughters, I'll call them all Fatima. And he did. He did. Fatima al Kubra, Fatima al Sukhra, Fatima al Wusta, Fatima al Ukhra. You know, Sukain or Ruqayn is not their names, by the way. It's not their names. These are titles because of their attributes. One brings you Sakina when you see her, the other brings Raqqa, comfort. To your heart. That's not their names, it's titles. It's like Sadiq, Kadhim, Rida. These aren't names, these are titles. If I had a thousand daughters, I'll name them Fatima. Sometimes people are about to name their daughter Fatima, and then someone says, No, but we have a cousin called Fatima. So what? English and Irish, wallah, I've seen a hundred of the same name in the family. One family, so many are with that name. Does anyone say, But your cousin's called that? Just get on with it. Because when you travel anywhere in the world and you meet someone and she says, my name's Fatima, what does that do to you? Even, even if that person is not religious, you're just proud that there is a Fatima. And when you meet Imam al Hussein says, if I had a thousand sons, I'll name them all after my father. Was it just walk the walk or did he talk it? How many Ali is at Karbala? Allah. It's amazing, really, when you look at Imam Hussein's son's names. You have Ali al Azgar, baby. You have Imam Zain al Abidin, Ali ibn al Hussein. You have Ali al Akbar. Imam al Hussein, why don't you name another name? Look in the Quran for a nice word. You know, people these days, they look for like a word in the Quran which is nice, which is not a problem. Wallah, it's not a problem. But why is Imam al Hussein not using these nice words about, you know, I don't know, something in heaven, for example? Like a name of like a plant in heaven. Nice name. But why does he always name Ali? Ali, Ali. Because make sure that that name remains alive. So that Bani Umayya realize. وَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيَّ مُنْقَلَبٍ يَنْقَلِبُونَ So those who oppress you, they realize what the end is for the oppressor. Karbala! Ali al-Azghar, he gave Azghar away. And at the same time, Ali al-Akbar, Allah. He made sure. Ali al-Akbar's mom, Layla, who is she? Muawiyah's niece. Layla, daughter of Maymuna, daughter of Abu Sufyan. That's crazy. Muawiyah's niece is Akbar's mom. Yazid is Akbar's mom's first cousin. There's a huge moment in Karbal. There were two at Karbala. The 
families are in the opposition. One of them is Abbas bin Ali. His mother, Umm al Banin, is related to Shimr bin al Joshan. And so Shimr said, Where's Umm al Banin's for? I offer them sanctuary. Come with me on my side. And Abu al Fadl, he looked towards them. He couldn't believe the audacity. You talk about me related to you. And you want me to come on your side and leave Imam al Hussein. And Imam calmed him. Imam said, You know what? Leave it, Abbas. But can you imagine the arrogance of the opposition? When they come to Ali al Akbar, they're like, Leave your dad. And come on our side. We will protect you. The Amir, you're related to him. Your mom's his first cousin. This moment broke Akbar. You've, you kept my dad thirsty. You've humiliated him. And now on top of all of that, you expect me to leave him. And he wanted to now come out. And you know, for his father, this is the toughest moment now. Because he absolutely loved him. I don't think you could see a closer relationship. And he said, Dad, you know what? Let me go now. Every person on the 10th of Muharram who asked Imam al Hussein, in a way, tries to persuade them not to go. Even Abbas, he says to him, go and get the water. Ali al Akbar is the only one Imam al Hussein didn't try and stop. Why? Not because he wanted to see him die. He never had the strength at that moment to stop him. Because it overtook Imam al Hussein. He held his son so tight. If we imagine the scene, the father, son crying with each other, they couldn't stop crying. Until the narrators say Imam Hussein virtually faints. And then he says to him, go on. And he rides his horse and all of a sudden his father tells him, come back. He said, father, what is it? I thought you bid me farewell. He said, go and bid farewell to your mother and to your auntie Zainab. He bids farewell to his mother, Auntie Zainab comes back out, again goes, and his father says, come, I said, what is it, father? He said, son, you don't know how hard it is for a father to bid farewell to his son. <laughs> May Allah never show any of you bidding farewell to your child that last time. May Allah never show any of you. Only Allah knows those mothers and fathers in Iraq, how many of them, they never saw their sons again. How many of the people watching never saw their brothers and sisters again? He came out in front of that opposition. He was thirsty. The thirst had killed him. But when he stood in front of them, he made a statement to highlight that there's no way in hell that my grandfather's name will be forgotten. You've worked for 20 years to try and make sure that you delete his name. Ana Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali. I am Ali. He could just say Ana Ali. That's it. I am Ali. Son of Hussein, son of Ali. I'm going to give you the whole family tree. That was a statement. It wasn't just a line saying who my origin is. No, 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 no. Ali ibn Abi Talib is not dead because his grandson Akbar is here. Ana Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali. Nahnu wa baytullah. Awla bin Nabi. Us and the house of Allah have a greater right to the Prophet. Not you people. We are the ones who have a greater right to the Prophet. I'll strike you with my spear until I finish you. I'll strike you with my sword to defend my father. 
Here's now the decisive two lines. What strike? I'll strike you with my sword. No, no, it's not just that I'm going to strike you. I'm going to tell you what type of strike it is. What the origin is of this strike. The strike of a youth who's so proud of his Shiism and his origin. That is not the strike. Darba Muslim. Darba Mu'min. Darba Ghulamin. Hashimi Alawi. The strike of a youth who's from Bani Hashim and who's from Ali. Wallah la yahkumu fiin ibn da'i. Wallah the son of zina will never ever rule over us. You son of illegitimate birth telling me that I leave my father. Never will I leave my father. On the contrary, here I am and I'll be out on the battlefield. I want you to think of one thing. The mother in the tent, what's going through her heart? Akbar is her only boy. What's going through Layla's heart? When her son is in the middle of a battlefield, he is fighting valiantly. She cannot tell how he's doing. How does a mother tell at this moment? She would look at the face of Imam al Hussein. She'd look at the face of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. She'd keep looking at his face. Is he smiling? Is he sad? Is there a change in the complexion? She kept on looking and looking and looking. She saw a change in the complexion of the face of Abba Abdullah. She said to him, Abba Abdullah, tell me, tell me, how is my son doing? Tell me. He looked towards her and he said to her, Oh Layla, I see a group about to attack our son. But oh Layla, no one thing that the dua of a mother is never rejected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said to her, Layla, recite a dua for your son at this moment. What dua does she recite? This dua, I think, is a dua that any of us who face troubles in our life try and recite this dua. In the first line of this dua, Oh Allah, I ask you in the name of the loneliness of Abba Abdullah. First thing. When you're in trouble somewhere in life, ask in the name of the Ghurba of Hussein bin Ali. Oh Allah, I ask you in the name of the loneliness of Abba Abdullah. I ask you in the name of the stranger that is Abba Abdullah. Third thing, I ask you in the name of the thirst of Abba Abdullah. Always ask in the name of Atash al Hussein alayhi salam. This is very dear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then she said oh Allah you returned Yusuf back to Yaqub you returned Ismail back to Hajar return my Ali back to me all of a sudden he returned back to his mother he entered the tent he embraced his mother he talked with his mother then he saw his father Imam al Hussein alayhi Salam. When he looked at his father, what happened? He began to talk to his father. He looked at him. He said to him, Father, are you proud of what I've done? He said to him, My son, of course I am. He said, But Father, the thirst of Karbala is killing me. Can you imagine the thirst of Akbar? But what then happens shows you something worse. What is it? A father, if he sees his son's thirst, he will try and get him water. He couldn't get him water. So if a father, even if he sees his son thirsty, he may even give some of his saliva to his boy. He bought Akbar's tongue to his tongue. Uh, when he bought the tongue, he was hoping that some of the wetness of the tongue would help Akbar. Uh, Akbar looked at his father. He said to him, Father, your tongue is drier than mine. Uh, imagine the thirst of Abba Abdullah that his own son says to him, Father, your tongue is drier than mine. Uh, Imam al Hussein looked towards his son. Uh, he said to him, Son, go out one fire 
final time. In a few moments, your grandfather will quench your thirst from the pool of Gothar. Within a few moments, the heart of Fatima Zahra fell on the earth of Karbala. When he fell on the ground, he called out for his father to come and help him. All of you work with me on this moment, please. Imam al Hussein, when Qasim fell, ran. When Abbas fell, he ran. When Aoun and Muhammad fell, he ran. When Habib fell, he ran. The only person he never ran towards was Akbar. Why? For what reason? His legs, his legs weren't allowing him to run towards his son. Imagine the shock. Imam al Hussein was not able to run. Then there's a second thing. Akbar was in one side. Imam began to go another. Sukaina called out, Father, where are you going? What's going on? He said, what do you mean? She said, Akbar's there. Why are you going here? He said, Sukaina, don't blame me. <laughs> Sukaina, my darling, don't blame me. The fall of your brother has blinded me. Imam al Hussein could not see which way he was heading because his boy was now on the ground. The Imam reached Akbar. He sat by him. When he sat by him, what's the first thought that came to him? Where's my father, Amir al Mu'mineen? Why? You lifted the gate of Khaybar, but you never had to lift a dagger from the chest of your son. Come to Kabul. And help me. Uh, can you imagine that scene? The two of them looking at each other that final time. Uh, every year we repeat this. Uh, father looking at son. Son looking at father. Injuries everywhere. Uh, he says that when he was looking at him in that final moment, uh, he saw Ali al Akbar smile. Then he saw him cry. Allah, what is it, my son? Tell me, what is it that makes you smile? Uh, and what is it that makes you cry? If she's here tonight, I beg for her forgiveness. Father, I cry, I smile because I see my grandfather walking towards me now. And we all ask that Rasulullah comes to us when we die. Father, I smile because I see my grandfather walking towards me now. But son, why do you cry? This is for all of you now. I cry. Because I see my grandmother Fatima Zahra in front of me. But what makes you cry? I cry because for every tear that you shed, Father, I see her slap herself on her cheek in front of me. I have one thing to say to Fatima Zahra if she's here tonight. I have only one line to ask her. How do you slap her cheek that's already been slammed? Inna lillahu wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Let's all raise our hands. Ya Allah, we ask for the intercession of Ali al-Akbar. Alayhi salam Ya Allah, allow us to be amongst those who visit the grave of the martyrs of the 10th of Muharram. Allow us to be amongst the companions of Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman Tomorrow night is the night of Ashura. Ya Allah, allow us to honor the message of Imam al Hussein and to protect the wilaya of his father, Ya Allah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those who have asked the dua in need. There are many, there are many of you sitting here with the tear as it flows. Ask for your hajat, for your parents, for your children, for your health, for your wilaya, for the religiosity. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the eye of the Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amman yujibu al-muftar idha da'a wa yakshifu al-su'u altogether. Amman yujibu al-muftar idha da'a wa yakshifu al-su'u. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا 
أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء in the name of the one who was ill at Karbala, Imam Zain al Abidin, Ali ibn al Hussein, alayhi salam, cure all of our loved ones, Ya Allah. Unite the Ummah on the love of Muhammad and Al Muhammad and on the dissociation from the enemies of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a Surah Al Fatiha in honor of the Marhumin who instilled in us the love and the wilaya of Amir al Mu'mineen. But before it, as we welcome Mullah Ali, the loudest of your salawat. Please rise in honor of Ali al Akbar alayhi salam and the words of a mother to her son. When I lost you, my tears they felt like rain. A mother hurt is like no other type of pain. When I lost you, Ali, my tears, they fell like rain. A mother's hurt is like a type of pain. I've lost you and soon I'll lose your father Hussein. I've lost you and soon I'll lose your father Hussein. Oh Ali, my heart's in pieces, now you're What I felt, see what I saw. Alone greeting your fate, I saw you on death's door. The cries when you fell in my mind, I can't ignore. I lost one and Abbas's mother lost so far. Oh, Ali, I'm still waiting to come back, you swore. A thousand words could never describe all my pain. To your sister, Ali, tell me how I explain. You were with me seconds ago, and now you're slain. I've lost you, and soon I'll lose your father, Hussein. I've lost you, and soon I'll lose your father. This day, Ali, I never thought of you as you grew. The moment you left me, my heart was split in two. For pieces of your body, the sand I search through with your blood, the grief of my heart, Karbala drew. Oh, Ali, now you're gone. Who will Hussein look to? Spears rain on him, Ali. What will he do? I call your name, Ali.
I call your name Ali, but I hear no reply. I raise my hands for you and look toward the sky. Alone you've left your father Can you hear his cry? I've lost you and soon I'll lose your father Hussain, assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah wa ala al-arwaah al-lati hallat bi fina'ik عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله ابدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا اجعله الله اخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى اولاد الحسين وعلى اصحاب الحسين many thanks many thanks to the poet الحاج حيدر القزاز الى ارواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات والى ارواح خدمه الحسين نهدي لهم ثواب سوره المباركه الفاتحه مع الصلوات This Muharram, IHDRF is giving you the chance to sponsor a majlis in Karbala. So many Mawakibs and Husayniya are struggling to support the Zawar and the mourners of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Your donations will help supply meat and rice to different majalis being held all over Karbala. Your name will be written alongside those who held lectures and programs for Imam Hussein. The majlis of Imam Hussein alayhi salam cannot stop and with your support it won't. Sponsor our majlis and help feed the mourners. You can pay via PayPal, bank transfer or online by visiting www.ihdrf.org. towards the preservation and the propagation of the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Indeed, one of the best ways to work towards the reappearance of Imam al-Mahdi ajalallah ta'ala faraju sharif is through promoting the values of Karbala. Imam Hussein Media Group is the only Shia television network that broadcasts globally in five different languages, Arabic, Farsi, Turkish, Urdu, and English. We are appealing to the lovers of Imam Hussein alayhi salam worldwide to support the channel such that it may continue its global operations. Imam Hussein Media Group is seeking 1,000 partners to pledge to a 14 pound contribution per month. This will allow the channel to sustain its operating costs as we continue to spread the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam in multiple languages across the globe. You be a part of this great legacy and donate today. You can pledge in two ways. www.imamhussein3.tv slash donate will take you direct to our donation page where you can pledge monthly. Or you can call or WhatsApp us on 0044-793-991763. Imam Hussein TV, your gateway to Karbala. Oh,